Uh, thank you for joining us today for Virtual Insights, Judith Scott. My name is Persephone and I'm the manager of adult public programs at the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. We're so thrilled to be joined by so many of you online today and we're grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support for virtual programs. As many of you are familiar with AFAM, our museum is dedicated to expanding the appreciation and understanding of self-taught art across time and place. For anyone tuning in today from New York City, we're thrilled to share that our galleries uh, at Lincoln Square have reopened and you can now reserve tickets online to see works from our current exhibition, American Perspectives, curated by Stacey C. Hollander. We're also incredibly grateful for opportunities like this to connect online with colleagues and visitors near and far. And as always, we want to thank and recognize the healthcare workers in our communities who continue to combat the ongoing pandemic, as well as workers battling wildfires on the West Coast. Today's conversation is organized to mark the 30th anniversary of the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act this year by taking a closer look at the celebrated life and work of self-taught fiber artist, uh, Judith Scott. We are honored to be joined by our senior curator, Valerie Russo, and Tom DiMaria, Director of External Relations at the Creative Growth Art Center in Oakland, California, where Jiv first began making work in the 1980s. We'll begin today with introductions, followed by Tom and Valerie's discussion before um, opening up the conversation for Q&A. This is a webinar, so um, we aren't able to see or hear attendees, but we do want to invite you to participate by using the chat for comments and the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. And again, we'll respond to as many of those at the end of today's program as time allows. Um, just to the right of the Q&A, you'll see the initial CC. Um, today's program is being transcribed live, so please click on this button to view closed captions. And a final note, um, again, to say that this program is being recorded and will be published online following the conversation. Our thanks to Director of IT, Richard Ho, for his technical support today. It is my pleasure to introduce Valerie Russo, Senior Curator of self-taught art and art fruit at the American Folk Art Museum in New York City. Since 2013, Valerie has curated numerous exhibitions on artists from various countries, including the award-winning When the Curtain Never Comes Down on performance art and Art Fruit in America, The Incursion of Jean Dubuffet in 2015. And her upcoming exhibition, Photo Fruit, will open at AFAM in 2021. And this is, of course, among many other shows. Valerie received her PhD in art history from the University of Quebec in Montreal and her MA in anthropology from the School for Advanced Studies and Social Sciences in Paris. Her many publications on international artists emerging outside the mainstream include Visionary Architectures from 2013 and Revealing Art Brut from 2010. Tom Di Maria was hired as Director of Creative Growth Art Center in January 2000. Since then, he has developed partnerships with museums, galleries, and international design companies to help bring creative growth artists with disabilities fully into the contemporary art world. Prior to joining Creative Growth, he served as assistant director of the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive at UC Berkeley, and executive director of the San Francisco International Lesbian and Gay Film Festival. He received his MFA in photography from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, and his BFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology. He has received filmmaking awards from Sundance and others for experimental filmmaking. And in 2019, he received our very own Visionary Award for his unique contributions to the field of self-taught art. We're excited to be joined by Valerie and Tom and delighted to share virtual space with you all today. I'd like to welcome Valerie to begin. Thanks for your introduction, Persephone, and welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for a discussion on the life and art of Judith Scott, which will last about 60 minutes before opening up to questions. So we look forward to receiving your feedback during the Q&A at the end of the conversation. I would like to start with a brief portrait of Judith Scott's career. Uh, she was born in 1943 and died in 2005 at the age of 62. She created over 150 multimedia textile sculptures over uh, a 17 year period at Creative Growth. So starting in 1990. Her works are in the most important private and museum collections worldwide. Among them, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Everything in London, and the Collection de l'Art Brut in Switzerland. 
Her works have been included in major exhibitions internationally, notably a first comprehensive retrospective at the Brooklyn Museum in 2014. I am inviting you to see two of our works currently on display in a collection-based exhibition at the American Folk Art Museum, one in American Perspectives and uh, another piece that I heard someone describe um, as a giant caveman tutip, <laughs> how unexpected. So uh, I, I wanted to, for today's discussion, uh, to welcome my friend and colleague, Tom DiMaria, uh, that we all, all profoundly admire for his exemplary contribution to the arts. Uh, Tom has a unique first-hand viewpoint on Judith's oeuvre. He witnessed the evolution of her work over time and interacted uh, with her at Twitter over many years. Uh, as Tom rightly pointed out to me, the life and art of Judith bring three moments in perspective. The first one is a long history in the United States of sending individuals with disabilities in psychiatric hospitals. The second is the impact of a landmark legislation, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the third is the foundation of creative growth. Tom, uh, would you please walk us through uh, these founding moments, starting with Judith's biography? Sure, I'd be really happy to, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm just sorry to not see everyone in the audience today because that's always such a great and impactful part of talking about Judith's life and creative growth. And we're gonna hear about an amazing woman and uh, her life is so compelling. And I think the way that it, mirrors how her life as a person with a disability sort of follows the history of how people with disabilities in America during her lifetime have radically changed. It's interesting to see the impacts. And today, you know, we're thinking about the recognition of the 30 year anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we'll see how that's really come to be quickly, a little history, and how um, Judith is a part of that change. So, you know, one of the things when Judith was born, one of the things we talk about in the field of so-called outsider art or visionary art is what role the biography of the artist plays in understanding the work. And I know Valerie and I will talk about this a little bit later. But if you're interested in the biography, you know, Judith Scott has the most, one of the most compelling biographies in outsider art, if you will use that term. Here, Judith is born in, in 1943 in Ohio with a twin sister, Joyce. So this is Joyce on the left and Judith on the right. They're not identical twins. Judith is born with Down syndrome and death. And the girls, as was keep it at the time, were raised by their family until about age five or six together. And then one of the things we're gonna learn about the ADA is at the time of Judith's um, birth, people with disabilities were routinely segregated and institutionalized and taken out of society. And that was the path at the time. Um, and that happened to Judith. So the girls spent a few years together and then at the advice of the doctor, Judith was taken out of the bed in the middle of the night, separated from her sister and institutionalized, where she spent about 40 years in an institution. During that time of the institution, they didn't know she was deaf, so she was never taught language or sign language. So it was a, a terrible situation. Um, during that time, um, what 40 years later, her sister Joyce did this wonderful thing for her. As the idea of disability changed, Joyce said, we don't do this anymore, and went back to Ohio and got Judith out of the institution and brought her to Berkeley where Joyce was living. Joyce is a talented writer and thought, well, if I'm creative, maybe Judith will create it, be creative. Let's find a path forward for her. So now at the same time in the 70s and early 80s, um, as the ADA is kind of starting to come to be, creative growth is starting to come to be. So I know we have some um, disability historians in the audience today, so pardon my sort of summary of history here quickly, but the landmark 1964 Civil Rights Act in America did not include people with disabilities. And people with disabilities did not really have any sort of rights against discrimination until something called Section 504 came up in the 70s, which gave them access to um, uh, federal resources. That 
section never was really adopted um, or implemented until the late 70s when disability activists had sit-ins across the country in federal buildings and demanded that the United States government stand behind that section and enable it. And when it came to be, it was really during the, when President Ronald Reagan was in power, he tried to deactivate that section, which motivated the community to come together and to really push for what became the Americans with Disabilities Act. So it's an important lesson because sometimes a step back, someone trying to push you backwards uh, advances a community in the cause. But at that same time in California, 1970s, what's happening? Well, it's a time of enormous social change. There's the Civil Rights Act has been passed. People with disabilities are being deinstitutionalized. There's gay power, black power, black panthers, birthday free speech, summer of love, hippie culture. The world is changing. And as people with disabilities in California are being deinstitutionalized, our founders of Creative Group, Lawrence and Alliance Katz, a psychologist and an artist, feel that art is the way forward for these folks whose lives have been lost and like so many great bay area stories it starts with a vision and someone putting paint in their garage in their home and moving forward and that's what happened so this is what creative growth would have looked like around the time when judith scott arrived so we're the first arts and disability program in the world and the largest and uh, while this photograph looks institutional to us, it was a radical departure from how people with disabilities led their lives. So Judith coming from 40 years of essentially forced isolation in the institution to this is given an opportunity to be in a creative environment. And this is what creative growth looks like now. Yeah. I love this switch from black and white to color because it's kind of like um, uh, The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy leaves Kansas and suddenly the world's in color. And I think you have to imagine what Judith would feel like coming into this environment after those four years of isolation without language. Yeah, Tom, uh, this is a recent photograph. Uh, what is the date of this image? Uh, it's about two or three years old. Okay. Um, before we move in this um, section of the discussion, I wanted to come back on something that we spoke about the other day. You mentioned that you do not wish uh, to hide the diagnosis. Uh, and I would like to discuss further this choice, as it is precisely, I think, something on which the art world has been vocal and very critical. Uh, as we know, diagnosis, and I'm, I'm you know, like the mere reference to a disability or a mental illness, uh, are often absent from uh, exhibition text. This under uh, the assumption that it's personal information, it discriminates, or it's irrelevant in terms of artistic appreciation. So um, I, I would say like on the opposite side, uh, you know, others will agree that the bio, the information, uh, biographical information is not trivial. Uh, uh, it informs uh, the understanding of a work that such creative uh, activity is deeply rooted uh, in personal life experiences. So can you explain where you stand towards these uh, diagnoses? Sure, it's an interesting, complicated question and I'm evolving on it all the time. My personal feeling is that the art has to speak for itself. And if you look at Judith's work or another creative growth artist's work and it's interesting and compelling then there's all kinds of questions to ask about who the artist is, the, the context and the circumstances under which it was made, and if there's a disability involved, how that influences the, the maker's work. And you know, what I've learned from people in the disability field is that, and people with disabilities themselves, is that you know, there's nothing shameful about the disability. Why would you hide it? And it's not about hiding it. It's about having the work be seen uh, as its own, um, as, with its own aesthetic power, and then understanding the disability, if there is one, in terms of the complexity of the entire artist's work and body of work. And you know, we'll see in Judith's work and some other creative growth artists' work how the disability is essential to their work and how it really can't be removed from what they're doing because it informs the work. And it should be in that context that we understand it. 
Right. Um, and so actually we are, we are seeing an image now just after this overview of creative growth. Um, what if you walk us through the workshops uh, starting from the first years that Judith attended to? Sure. So Judith comes to us through the grace of her sister Joyce and essentially sits at a table for two years without language and not really being very productive in the community. Creative Growth has a plan um, where that it allows people to be in our studio for as long as they need to be to find their way because we understand their life circumstances have been challenging. Judith made a series of maybe 10 or 12 drawings during that time. This is one of them. So she would make a kind of do drawings or make a, this kind of motion with her hand. And, um, but often she didn't draw and she would sit there making the motion and people would say, oh, she just needs to draw more. She needs to draw. But that wasn't the path forward for her. And there was a visiting artist by the name of Sylvia Seventy who came to Creative Growth because we have a visiting artist program. And she brought some fiber and fabric materials and she was leading a workshop. And Judith grabbed some sticks and yarn and started to make her first sculpture. This is not the first sculpture, but it's similar to what the first sculptures were like. And suddenly, you know, it was about two or three years into her time at Creative Growth. And I think about how it's kind of her second life. And that's when a child starts to speak at age two or three. And I think she's finding her path forward, finding her language. She wants to tell us her story. And I think about her sitting there trying to understand what's happened to her and uh, wanting to communicate with us. And this is the solution she comes up with. And Tom, of course, mm -hmm. I, was, I was wondering if you can walk us through the fact that, um, you know, during these first years, she had a, a, a space that was designated. Uh, and I would like to understand, or better understand, maybe we can share with the public, um, you know, uh, elements of her working space and how she was finding her materials and how all this uh, connection happened. Sure. So an early piece like this, which looks a little bit ethnographic to me or shamanistic, she would have taken um, yarn from the rug making area and these, these little beads I think are probably taken out of the ceramic studio and maybe made by other artists. She would go around and collect, like this is raffia that kind of came, probably came out of a garbage or donated materials or a weaving program that we had. So she always sat at the same table on um, the little red straps you see on the chair next to her is her bag. She would bring in things. She collected magazines. She would sit pretty much by herself. She would come in five days a week. She would sit at the table and she would work until she went home and she didn't really like to be interrupted. She ate her lunch at that table. Here you see there's at the base of this sculpture, there's some picture frames that I'm sure she grabbed from the studio or the gallery. Um, there's some cardboard, there's yarn, there's foam packing material that was discarded. So she would go around and appropriate, which is an art historical word for steel, things from other artists and people around the studio and build them into these sculptures. You know, and one of the important questions about her is, what was she doing? Like, why would she do this for 20 years? There was no artist statement, so it's interesting. And some people see a lot of symbolism in her. A piece like this, people refer to it as the twin sisters are back together or they're, you know, uh, girls back in the womb. And, you know, it's hard not to see that if somebody raises that idea to you. But, you know, and this, is this a figurative piece? Is this her sort of bound, wanting to be unbound? Is it her, uh, a sense of freedom or confinement that she's seeking? But here you see the material she uses. She uses fabric, there's green fabric, the black checkerboard fabric, the fabric that's from the face, so it's not just yarn, there's infrastructure. And we'll look at some details. People sort of often say, well, she wrapped sculptures in yarn. She didn't really, she wove them. And there's tensions and intricacies within the sculptures that are quite sophisticated. Um, um, I'm curious to see how did she organize the materials? Uh, I think you said that she kept the materials underneath this ta the table she was working uh, on. So what, how, how this material, these materials were organized uh, underneath? Yeah, I think I have a slide coming up. Um, she kept the sculpture on the table. 
and, uh, and she had a box of materials that she used. There'll probably be an image of it coming up soon. So she had multiple pairs of scissors, spools of yarn, thread, vacuum cleaner hoses, magazines, cardboard, you know, her lunch pal, whatever she was keeping around, she'd store in there. She'd work on the sculpture during the day. And at night, and this is something we've seen with some of our folks that had been institutionalized, she would hide everything because she was afraid it would be stolen. So at the end of the day, she'd put the sculpture under her table, she'd put the box under the table, she'd push her chair in, she'd make sure it was kind of confined. And uh, I think she was afraid it wouldn't be there the next day. And the next day she'd come in and she'd put the box on the table and she'd put the sculpture on the table and she'd sit down and she'd pick up where she left off. If something ever happened to it accidentally during the night, a, a cleaner moved it or somebody took something from by mistake, she was upset and she would know that it had changed. Um, so it wasn't accidental. It was a process that was continuous, that was thoughtful, that was evolving. And, uh, and, and she knew that. And here you'll see the actual process she would take threads and put them through and sort of weave them. And here she's getting ready. She clips the end and she takes the end of the thread and yarn and she, she tucks it back in and she's making these tensions. This is not wrapping, this is weaving. This is building almost spider webs and uh, other kinds of tensioned patterns. Yeah, indeed, Tom, you, you um, just to go back on the, on the techniques, um, she, uh, this is not like a simple wrapping process. I mean, there are different um, ways of, of um, organizing the surface of our artworks. And I think that you can, can you expand and, and talk about the different ways she manipulates uh, the materials? Yeah, sure. So um, here's a, a good example. So first of all, you see her table with the box. So that's a typical box where she'd store her supplies. So we see a couple of um, spools of thread and different kinds of things, scissors on the table. Sometimes there were multiple um, pairs of scissors. Um, notice the headdress, her necklaces. You'll see as we progress, as she became more advanced in her work, her headdresses and her look advanced as well. She started to dress like her sculptures, which is very compelling. This is a piece we'll see Later in an exhibition view of her work, she's wrapping a shopping cart. So this is a particularly, this is one of the largest pieces she ever made. And uh, I don't know, I think the cart she pulled in off the street. What she's done here is put the sculpture she was making in the cart and now she's wrapping the whole thing. So, and you can see how she's building these intricate patterns of tensions um, with the threads and the yarns. And this is not unlike what she would do with some of her sculptures. She would build a small sculpture and then it was looking like it was finished. And then sometimes she would put it in on top of another one or start or put it inside another. So she was often building these layers like this piece here on top of the frame could have been a finished piece, but then she puts it on top of something and built it again. So part of the conceptually interesting parts about her work is that there's so many hidden parts of it inside that we don't really know what's in there. But she was building sculptures within sculptures and layers within layers. And there's these beautiful patinaed surfaces that have disappeared that won't be seen again. And you know, some, some conceptual artists really took to her work initially because of this idea of the unknown and what's in there. And without an artist statement, you know. So here you see her scissors, her yeah. paper, um, you, you see some spools of thread. Somebody's working on, on another table by her. She's not bothered by that. Here she's got the red beret and the red scarf because her headdress is her dressing. Tom, she's working all the time uh, on one sculpture at a time, uh, unless there are multi parts that would be um, joined together, right? Yes. So it was a one at a time kind of process. She would start and she would work on it until she was done. And she was very clear about indicating the finish. She would make a motion like this with her hands and she'd push it away. And, um, and then um, when the sculptures were finished, we would take them upstairs. So she would often point like, push it, like take it up there, get it, I'm done with it. And uh, she would start the next one right away. 
and that there was no particular interest in one a finished piece once it was finished. If we'd leave it around for a while on the table to make sure she was done, she didn't really pay it much attention and go back to it. I also think it's great. You know, she was very stubborn. So in possessive or things like, look, she has three pairs of scissors here because one wasn't enough. It's kind of like, you know, um, uh, you know, being prepared for uh, losing a pair. But yeah. if a sculpture like this is, um, you know, this big yellow ball looked like a, a finished sculpture. And then it goes on this cardboard base and styrofoam base and it's becoming the inside of another sculpture. So those decisions were hers and uh, watching her, you never know. We didn't know when she would stop or when she would continue. So it was very much her decision. And I think that a question comes up often for artists with disabilities about how, what is their intent? When is something finished? Is there an evolution? Is there a consciousness around creation? And I think we learn a lot from Judith in terms of those, the answers to those questions that she was very engaged. She was making decisions around color. She was making decisions around material. She was making decisions around completion. Yeah, and there's something to say about her extreme focus. Um, her consistency, you know, she was working, uh, as you said, five days a week and it went over a 20 year period. So there's an endurance, there's a labor there that we feel. Yes, and, uh, and also you have to remember, she's in a room with a hundred other artists and to have this kind of focus is great. So, you know, Creative Growth is a big artist's community and all the artists can see each other. And there's a community of our people together that's important. But individually, their work is always their own. And I think that duality is also particularly worth noting in that all the years of creative, of Judith Scott working there and of her later success and of other people at Creative Growth knowing about the success, no one really imitated her work or wanted to do the same thing. And I don't think that would have been true at an art school, for example. I think people might have experimented with that or say, okay, well, this is what people are interested in right now. Maybe I'll do that. A slight little footnote, in a lot of these photographs, this is like a American Folk Art Museum exclusive. A lot of these photographs have never been seen or seen publicly. So I hope people are enjoying. Um, and this is why I miss the audience because you don't really know if people are enjoying what they're seeing or finding it surprising or the reactions. On the, Cabinet behind her, not the white, but to the left, there's this little building. That's a maquette, a very rare maquette built by the creative book artist William Scott, that some of you may know, who has a show in New York right now that you should go see at Ortizar Projects um, that was reviewed by the New Yorker. And it, he used to build maquettes and architectural models of the housing projects he grew up in, and that's one. So, you know, within Judith doing this work, there's all these other people making work around her and it's just this great community of you know aesthetic development and yeah. um, you Indeed, know the space is a shared space it is a collective space um, with uh, some sometimes different educators walk, walking around so th there's something to say about the notion of privacy and there she is working three-dimensionally it's not uh, something that she can't hide she's exposed uh, and there's something very uh, strong about, about this, very, uh, I would say like there's a statement that, that should be made about this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also, you know, when we talk about the ADA or movements for civil rights, um, we think of them often legislatively, but we don't often think about them specifically in terms of how they've changed an individual's life. And to see Judith sitting here after 40 years of essentially forced segregation and having her work in a community with a kind of freedom and the sort of misdiagnosis that happened to her that prevented her from having language. I mean, these are real issues that happened in this country to people with disabilities and that her life and her emergence from that is very historically important because it mirrors the advancement that people with disabilities have made 
not only in the arts, but in society. And, you know, there were no role models of people with Down syndrome for Judith when she was in the institution. You know, those kinds of things have changed dramatically and there's still a long way to go. So as we celebrate 30 years of the ADA and the work that still remains, we should also understand the advances that have been made that allows for someone like Judith um, to have done this. So here you see again, you know, she would work her fingers almost like someone playing guitar until they were almost calloused from pulling the yarn through. And um, I remember a conversation with a fiber artist early on who said how the act or the idea or the motion of pulling yarn through your hands and touching materials is a very soothing, meditative kind of um, practice for a lot of artists. And I think Judith found comfort in that. And I think the tactile part of her work was extremely important to her. You know, when one sense is blocked, others become more pronounced, you know. And Judith as a person, you know, we developed our own in-house sign language with each other. She used to like to drink Pepsi and she would do this kind of command to me to go get her a beverage. She collected magazines and she, she would like to bring those in. And uh, we would open the magazine and we would smell the perfume scent strips because that was another nonverbal way to share an experience, you know? So one of the things that created growth is just to um, understand that everyone communicates with each other as human beings in very different ways and not to make assumptions about what that path forward is going to be for someone. You know, she's, um, I think if we had a very didactic program that instructed people or an artistic program where we uh, said, okay, today we're going to do two point perspective or we're only going to um, learn how to do this one technique no one would have brought in vacuum cleaner tubing and you know yarn and lace and encouraged an artist to make that i don't think so often what the artist comes up with is more inventive than what we can imagine for that yeah when looking at this sculpture uh, particularly i mean we can we can go back on our favorite materials there's something to say about or spatial attention to colors, and we talked about textures, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, it's a beautiful piece. And I think this was the piece that was on the cover of the Brooklyn Art Museum, um, a retrospective of Judith's work that we'll see because um, it, it really has a, a abstract quality, a painterly quality. I mean, the colors and the placements are quite amazing. And here, I think this is an amazing image because she looks like her work. I mean, look how she's dressed in the color and the beads and the white in her work and how the headdress is, does she have two hats on or three with tassels and three necklaces? And, you know, she's, um, you know, living the dream. I mean, she's really becoming um, a sense of herself and a sense of achievement and accomplishment. And she was very, um, a very hard worker. If you came to meet her in the studio and you came up to the table, she would probably wave hello and sometimes shake your hand and be entertained by that for a moment and then push you away because she wanted to get back to work. Um, people often ask, was there a sense of her as, um, as her work became more renowned, did she know that? And um, I think so. She certainly knew that she had more visitors and that people had an interest in her and what she was doing. Yeah, this image is, is amazing. I know, as you point out, it's, it's true that she's dressing her message. And it seems clear to me that the hats, the two, three hats that she was sometimes putting on top of each other, the clothes that she's wearing are not random. And uh, on the other, they are carefully selected, uh, a bit like, she's staging or performing this creative moment. And I think it's, it's a very re revealing uh, image in that regard. 
there was certainly a part of working with her where it was performance art. You know, it was very compelling to watch. And she was um, a very interesting, interesting artist in many ways. And I, on the table here next to her, the blue bag, it says, Judith, that's her lunch bag. Um, our artists typically bring their own lunch and we have a lunch room. She often ate at her own table because she didn't like to spend too much time eating because it took away from her sculpture making. Um, talk about materials. This is made out of paper towels. So one day she went into the bathroom and she just kept on rolling the paper towels and rolling them up. And, uh, you know, and uh, what a gorgeous uh, creation she's made from it. It's very fragile. It's in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum now. We're delighted that they're conserving it for us. Her work is not easy to conserve. Um, it's fragile. Its contents are unknown. Um, it, you know, and, uh, you know, it raises issues that way. As well. um, I have a quick question about um, evolution because uh, is it like a, one of the latest pieces that she has done or how this this work this specific work uh, falls into the evolution of, and maybe we can talk about this 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 idea of evolution uh, if I may uh, of her um, creative processes and you know her first works as opposed to the latest works if you can point out some, some information about, about this. Would yeah, you? absolutely. This piece is probably mid-career. I don't have the exact date, but um, it's not, there are later pieces, which we'll see in a minute, that are, are rough. For me, the material here is different because of the paper, although stylistically, it's like some of the ball forms that she made sort of mid-career. And again, you'll see her here, how she would trim um, the the yarns and then she would tuck the anding strip back into the sculpture. So of course, when you pick up the sculpture now, things fall out. And uh, you know, that's a, um, a museum level conservation project in terms of um, keeping it going forward. And again, looking at materials, um, a lot of people donate a lot of things to create a growth. So we, people would leave bags of fi fabric and strips and yarn and, bathrobes and all sorts of things. And she would just really enjoy digging through them and coming up with this, which, you know, almost looks like what a Lucas Samaras fabric painting or something that really, um, as a surface, it's compelling. And here, you know, I think people who think her choices are random and not about color and form are mistaken. I think this is a particularly elegant and informed, sophisticated, um, multi-dimensional painting. And here, um, Valerie, I think you were referring to this in some ways. This is a very late piece and her work shifted at the end and her work became much more um, almost art brut or rough and raw with the, the surfaces weren't finished and materials were exposed. And it was an interesting time because a piece, it was, she was getting older and she um, couldn't lift the pieces as well and she was getting weaker. And she would push the piece, this piece away like she was done with it. And I remember thinking, well, maybe she's just tired or maybe she doesn't want to lift it anymore. Maybe, so we made sure she had access, it, access to it longer that it was on the table, she didn't have to lift it, she could go back to it, you know, was there something, but um, she knew what she was doing and it led to a series of pieces like this towards the end of her career that were um, rough. I mean, you'll see these big spools of yarns and tubes and on the left there's plastic, that's a plastic file folder that would have held client folders in somebody's office. So there's all sorts of things um, buried in here and she liked this kind of um, rough surface. But there's a consistency in our use of fiber, of textile. Yes. From the beginning, the first years up to the end, right? Correct. That's literally and figuratively the thread that holds it all together. I mean, you know, that's, that's always um, a part of the sculpture and that's always um, the, you know, it's like the painter using paint. She's always ha using this material and then she's um, experimenting it with different ways. This is, yeah, Dan Miller. Um, 
which brings me to uh, a quick question about about her linguistic approach or um you know as opposed to other artists at, at creative growth like dan miller or uh, Tony Pedemonti uh, in the use or her use of the threads and his use of the lines and the technique of Tony as opposed to the one that use um, uh, Judith in, in the wrapping uh, is, is sculptures. I, it would be great if you, if you give some nuances about, about their distinctive approaches. Sure, so this is the artist, uh, creative growth artist Dan Miller some of uh, you may know, um, Dan worked, still works at Creative Growth, and Dan worked for many years with Judith um, separately. Um, and this is, uh, comes back to the idea of um, what role does disability play in the work. And Dan's on the autism spectrum and is pretty much nonverbal, and his, his family encouraged him to try to speak as a boy by spelling words with him. And I like to say, instead of co them coming out of his mouth, the words came out of his hand, and he writes the words that he learned to spell um, on these, um, in this case, large paintings and drawings where the words are obsessively written on top of each other, one after the other, until they form these abstract patterns of lines and color explosions that are not entirely different from um, just And I think that um, if I think of her work as being part of her language, his work is certainly part of his language. Stylistically, they relate. They've been in shows in New York together, and I think they're you know, very different, but there's something about what they're doing that um, is process-based, that's communicative, that's aesthetically compelling, where the artist is making choices around color and lines and aesthetic decisions that are fascinating to see. Now, another artist at Creative Growth that confused me a lot, honestly, is the artist Tony Pedamonte. Um, Tony's work um, has similarities to Judith's work directly, and so does his life story. He happens to be a twin um, who came to Creative Growth and started making some drawings that weren't particularly, that were sort of all over the place and kind of explosive. And then he started to wrap objects in um, fiber and, and, uh, and on a table like Judith did. And it was, uh, you know, he doesn't really speak very much. He's a quiet guy. He didn't work with her, he didn't know her work. And uh, it threw me for a loop in terms of thinking of it in relationship to Judith Scott's work. And, and then I said, to, and then I thought, well, we have many abstract painters at Creative Growth. Why is it different than that? They have their own style and form. And I've come to see that his, I see his work as being more formal, more about shape and surface and texture, a little bit more minimal. And to me, a piece like this does not look like a Judith Scott piece, although we can see that they share commonalities, perhaps in terms of process. Um, and the structure of Tony's works, you know, we know that she was wrapping different objects that she carefully selected uh, elsewhere in, in the workshop area. Um, Tony is, is, is wrapping, or is not wrapping, but is like building a structure made of wood, for instance, or what is the difference between what's inside as opposed to the outside? Yeah, I see his work as being more um, sculptural. Like here, it's more simple wood forms that are wrapped. I think the idea of building and hiding and protecting and layering and stuff is more of a Judith Scott thing. I think of Tony as being more sculptural, and I think of her as being more conceptual. I think that she has, um, there was a performative element to her work, there was um, a symbolic element to her work, there was a sense of hiding and protecting and building and going back into the womb and with the sister and finding freedom that, um, that where his work is more um, a visual pleasure. And, um, and I think he also gets the sort of rhythmic, hypnotic kind of pleasure from making the work that many fiber artists do. Yeah. And I think if we're going to talk a little bit about how we come to understand the work, I have a great review of Judith's work by Roberta Smith, who I think is one of the best writers on the planet these days in terms of art criticism. And, you know, one of the questions is, you know, what is Judith doing? 
And uh, you know, you can read here, Roberta Smith says that they, they're relatives of a shaman's fetish or effigies or different kinds of sculpture and non-Western art. They have this kind of power, um, which I think is important. And then this last paragraph, I think relates to a lot of visionary artists or so-called outsider artists in terms of what they're doing. And you know, she describes them as being carefully engineered three-dimensional paintings. And I think that's amazing. When we've seen some of those surfaces, they look like abstract paintings. And countering the impression that something has been hidden is the equally strong sense of something turned inside out. And the inescapable impression of a mind and a personality at work creating instances of insistent aesthetic communication. And for me, that's kind of as close as you can get to trying to understand what she was doing, creating instances of insistent aesthetic communication. It was aesthetic, it was communicating, it was insistent, it was nonstop. And I think um, that's a compelling way to look at it. And it poses curatorial questions for how do we present the work? Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's going to be the last the last part of, the, of our discussion to look at the interpretation of Judith's works through the lens of exhibitions. Um, we will agree that over the course of the last century, uh, Celtic artists have been increasingly praised for their impact on visual culture, but this acknowledgement uh, often happens after the death of the maker and without their direct involvement. And we think about other new artists like uh, James Castle or uh, Susan King. How can we interpret the work of Judith Scott without knowing about our intentions? And meanwhile, we can think that this specific context, the fact that she didn't voice her intentions, is favorable in a way that it makes the viewers, the curators, freer uh, in their artistic, inter uh, artistic interpretation and experiences of the works. Right. I've heard academically um, educated artists describe the fact or the reality that once the art leaves your studio, it kind of takes a life of its own. And I think in some ways that's true of Judith's work as well. This is one of the earliest exhibitions of her work. People ask, did she ever go to an exhibition? She did. This is her fabulous sister Joyce on the left and Judith's on the right, carrying her magazines like she did with her hat on. Um, and that's her niece Alana um, back there. And this is one. This is probably 2001 at a, a science uh, museum in San Francisco called the Exploratorium, where I was invited to do an exhibition about a creative growth artist through a grant from the National Science Foundation about the idea of perception. What are we seeing? So I staged Judith Scott's work in a sort of labyrinth, and as you moved through the exhibition without information, you were being asked what you were seeing. And there were little spots where you'd write your answer and put it in a ballot box. And in the beginning, people would say, oh, I'm convinced this is shamanistic, or no, this is Navajo basket weaving, or this is from, definitely from Papua New Guinea. I've seen this piece before. As you move through the exhibition, you'd get more information about the maker, the, where she worked, who she was. And by the end, you would come to see a different kind of totality of her um, relationship. Um, by the way, while Joyce is up here, um, Joyce has written a beautiful memoir of their life together called Entwined, E-N-T-W-I-N-E-D, like a play on entwined and entwined. And uh, that uh, took her a long time to write. And if you're interested in, in really their relationship, which is compelling, um, I think that's something to look at. So what does a curator do? This is an exhibition of her work at the Collection Dog Weaved in Lausanne. The museum there has a dark, you know, walls and ceilings, and it has a very particular kind of um, feeling you get from seeing the work. A very different installation in Tokyo. This is 2001, 2002, I think, um, the Shiseido Gallery there, where the curator had a very, and the installation designer, a very contemporary take on the work being seen as figures and figures almost hanging from the ceiling and the idea of walking through a kind of a crowded room. Uh, Tom, it brings me just this, looking at this image, um, 
as a way of us curators or viewers to look at the works of Judith Scott in a way that it informs us about, about their meaning, I think there is something to say about the fact that when she was working, her point of views, I mean, she was directly, uh, you know, she was so close to the works that she was making. I mean, she had no distance. It's not like she was walking back, looking at her process and coming back to the work. There's something about uh, her being very close and tied to the work. Uh, and this is something that sometimes is bring back or not in the museum experiences. And I think this is something that um, brings to mind when I look at this installation. Yeah, I mean, uh People describe having intimate relationships with the sculptures because they're almost animated in a way or figurative or, or have personalities. And, uh, you know, so Judith did not see this exhibition, but she was alive during this exhibition. So many of these exhibitions are taking place while she is a living, working artist as well. And uh, in, 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 so it's interesting to see. Um, also interesting to see this recently at the reopening of the MoMA in New York, her work in the context of other contemporary artists. And um, I did not see this installation personally. And I, I don't know, Valerie, if you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Do you know what the wall, you know, we talk about the text and the wall label. I don't know how this piece is labeled at MoMA. If it's, it's, it's very minimal. I mean, the information is mainly on, um, on the work, the space, the installation of that room as uh, it's called at the border of art and life. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, her work is alongside um, Fluxus works. Uh, you see a work by Yoko Ono. Uh, so these artists have um, different agendas than uh, Judith's works. Nonetheless, um, the pairing is extremely uh, interesting because it, it echoes the spirit of transformation and uh, that was at the core of, of Flux's works, but also uh, in, in Judith's own uh, practice and approach of the works. Well, that makes sense. I mean, this intersection between life and work is kind of what we're talking about in some ways when we talk about the role that disability plays for in an artist's work, that it is um, often an essential part of their life and what they're expressing. Not always, but in, in Judith's case, and I think Dan Miller's case, we see again and again that there's part of their life as adults with disability um, is a factor in terms of what they're expressing. This is two of her pieces in a group show at LACMA in Los Angeles. I mean, we see a quilt on the back by Rosie Lee Tompkins, who has a phenomenal show at the Berkeley Art Museum right now. I, we're not reopened in California yet, but you can view it visually, uh, virtually. And uh, she's uh, works in, she worked in the Bay Area, but it's a, a Southern American, African American quilt maker whose work is phenomenal. So in some ways it's, and uh, quilts by the G's Ben collected on the wall as well. So here we're seeing the work in context or relationship to other sort of traditional kind of folk art, but art artists using folk art in a way that's very powerful and contemporary looking. So I would imagine that um, Lynn Cook, who is the curator of this exhibition, um, is making some of those um, correlations with Judith's work as well. And then a final image here, one of the final is uh, the Brooklyn Museum show from a few years ago, organized by um, uh, Catherine Morris and Matthew Higgs together. And curatorially, they made a conscious decision to place the works on these uh, plinths in the direction um, that Judith most likely had the piece when she finished working. So that would be the surface, that would be how it was presented, how she would push it away. As much as we could tell, that's how it looked to her. On the far right, you see that shopping cart that she was wrapping um, in, in terms of, and they uh, arranged these curatorially. So, that, I mean, uh, chronologically, so that that's a very um, specific way to say, well, we don't really know how she would present them. And they didn't really take an expressionistic um, installation view of hanging up in the ceiling. It was like, let's try to be true 
to how the work looked in the artist's studio, essentially, and presented that way to the viewer. And that's interesting because all the works are on uh, the same height. The, the, the surfaces, I mean, the pedestals are all the same height on, on that photograph, at least. Uh, so this, the idea of um, that, that the look on earth sculpture is all the time the same. So you, you tend to look at the works to approach the work th with, the same, with the same physical approach uh, in, in the entire exhibition. There's a height that is uh, important in the way that we look at the work right now. Yes, it, it kind of makes the viewer, um, uh, uh, it equalizes the experience for the viewer. You have to approach them by yourself. And, you know, um, and also on the wall to the left, you see they presented, which is rarely seen, the drawing she made um, frame there um, to give it that additional context. So this is chronological. She made these drawings, then she made these works, and this is what they looked like when she was finished. Um, and here, this is her work at the Venice Biennale uh, a few years ago when she and Dan Miller were two creative growth artists that were um, invited to participate there. And again, a sort of simple installation on pedestals, you know, in the Arsenale, a very old, archaic, crumbling kind of building gives it this kind of atmosphere, whether you want to have it or not. It, it adds an interpretive um, reality to it. Yeah, so it was in 2015. 17, sorry. And this is one of the, uh, this is one of the final images. Uh, this is an amazing photograph of Judith Scott taken by the photographer Ann Collier. And uh, it was, it's one of the last significant or last portraits made of Judith before she died. And I think it's compelling in a number of reasons. One is that um, she doesn't have a headdress on and she always had a hat or something. And the way that she's holding her Coke and her scissors are down and she has this really sense, the sense of my work is done, the sense of completion, sense of accomplishments and uh, a sense of internalized sort of um, strength almost. I think it's a very compelling photograph. Judith died in her sister's arms a few weeks after this during a weekend they spent together in the country in the cabin. And uh, so, you know, the twins were born together and, it, and Judith died in her sister's arms, which is amazing. And I think it's also amazing to think about um, these crazy times we live in when we're all um, stuck at home and trying to figure out our lives and think about freedom and independence. And you know, I was thinking, I know we have like a, a ninth grade art class listening to this program today. And I think I was thinking about, wow, be a teenager right now and how being, not being able to go to parties or visit your friends or go out has to just seem like the end of the world. And I think, you know, to those kids, I would say, well, it, when Judith Scott was your age, she had 30 years left to live in her room before she, you know, came out and made this amazing career for herself. And so I see her as both an inspiration for us in terms of how we get through difficulty, how we mark time, how we hold the course, how our path, our future is really you know, anything that we want it to be. So I hope, and she's also a role model for people with Down syndrome and people with disabilities. And with the ADA in place and the work that still remains to be done, I think um, it's a really different world than she was born into. And I think she's an inspiring person and uh, artist. Yes, you're right. And um, to me, I would say uh, just in conclusion that there's something I can't ignore uh, when looking at the meanings uh, in Judith's art. It's the acknowledgement of this complex, I think, relationship between her as a person who suffered uh, from her disabilities and the psychiatric confinement and the large social context in which all that happened. We can't ignore the injustice, uh, the power relationships in her life uh, before and after creative growth, um, that she was feeding all these oppressions from all um, source and kinds. Uh, and that if, of course, uh, we don't want to strictly see our work from the lens of our condition, um, I think uh, this is at least a way or one of the best ways to understand that our work became 
a mechanism of empowerment. Um, and that would be my, my, um, my, my last few words uh, for this part of the discussion. Um, and I think that for Stephanie, uh, we should now um, try to have feedback from, uh, and questions from the audience. Well, thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation. I think um, I saw from the chat comments that we've all really enjoyed it and appreciated it and um, all of the insights that you've shared. So to begin our Q&A, um, I wanted to share this question um, that comes from John um, and it's directed towards Tom. And he asks if you could speak to Judith's activity of making uh, with regards to healing emotional therapy, sort of, I think you've, you've spoken about this, but um, if you could build on that or expand on it a little bit more. Sure. Um, you know, Catherine Morris just uh, titles the Judith Scott exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, Bound and Unbound. And I think that there's a lot of that um, that's um, apropos in terms of how um, uh, Judith used it as an implement for personal growth. And I think part of this, I think the physical part, part of the using threads and materials and the tactile nature and the protective, you know, sort of almost having you know, children in a way, or people close to her, or things that were hers, I think was healing and comforting and gave her a place of privacy and security in the world. And I think that, you know, I know that she didn't like change. If she came to create a growth and she had to leave for a doctor's appointment or was sick, it was very upsetting to her because she didn't know what was going to come next in her life, I think, in many ways. You know, you have to remember the language barrier. There was no way to say you have to go to the doctor to have surgery. It was suddenly you're, you were in a strange place and you didn't know when you'd get out. Um, so, and I think that the work, the 20 years of creative growth, the five days a week, that it was going to be under the table, that it was going to feel the same, that she had control. I think those were all important healing um, um, remedies for her. Thank you, Tom. And um, we did receive a question. Did you have um, hearing aids at any point in her life? No. No, she okay. did not have hearing aids. And she, it was not known that she was deaf until she was in the institution. They just thought she was profoundly dumb and, um, and not capable of language. So um, it really wasn't, it was after she was at Creative Growth that I think her sister saw in some medical record that she was diagnosed as being deaf and no one even noticed it. So I think at that point, you know, the capacity for, um, uh, you know, language acquisition or hearing was um, over. And uh, there was an improvised, and she didn't have written language, so there was an in, uh, improvised series of hand gestures and she was very emotional. She would, you know, cook with her nieces and, and, you know, kiss and hold her sister. And, you know, so there were intimacies. Um, but the, the language, I think, is the work that she made. Thank you. Um, we've received a number of questions about uh, process. And um, I just want to share a few of these because I think that they relate to one another. Um, so there's a question of, um, was she hiding creations uh, with another with by wrapping them the same way she protected um, other possessions? So is there the idea that she made a work and then um, made another work around that? And related to that, um, Carol wrote that she has a piece um, by Scott with a tambourine painted by Donald Mitchell um, inside of it. And was it typical for her to um, take another artist's work and um, to cover that as well. Well, that's a good one, Carol, because I know that piece. And uh, there were two examples that I know of um, where Judith has wrapped other creative book artists' work into her work. One is the Donald Mitchell tambourine, and another is a small chair that uh, Dan Miller painted on that has a bicycle wheel on it. It's, it's if you have the catalogs, it's kind of a, a well-known piece. And those are the times when, you know, her appropriation, her little shopping sprees around the studio, she'd grab whatever she wanted and wrap it into the, the piece. So, and sometimes it was other people's work. Sometimes it was Joyce Scott's husband's paycheck. There's been examples of car keys disappearing. So, um, so you know, that's part of the anecdotal. But I think it is about the earlier part of that in terms of process. I think it is about protection. 
I think it is about security. I think it is about, um, you know, building a skin around yourself or a kind of security blanket that protects something that's valuable. You know, she was a little bit of a hoarder, a little bit of a collector. And so the things she put in the sculptures were valuable to her. And, you know, she was putting, you know, she's, she was locking the barn door. And just one more quick question about process. Um, we had a question about her paper towel piece. And I know that we spoke about this in preparation for the program. So um, if we could maybe go back in the PowerPoint to that piece. The question was, um, how did she connect? Yes, let me, I just screwed everything up here, but let me try to figure it. And um, uh, where are we going? So yeah, so the, the paper towel piece, nobody, nobody let it match. It's very fragile. Um, it ha actually has, it's a little heavier than it looks. It has something in the middle that we don't remember or know what it is. Um, probably cardboard or something that, that formed it. And then she, we have a paper towel thing where you kind of pull them down like this. So she would do that and she'd wrap it and she'd put them and they're kind of just tied and knotted. It's very fragile. And when the, um, it's like, you can turn a fan on, low, but other than that, it's going to fall apart. When um, I was talking to Catherine Morris at the Brooklyn Museum about the fact that the museum wanted to acquire a piece for the collection after the show, I said, oh, how about that paper towel piece, knowing that, you know, we could never care for it in the way a museum could. And she said her conservators were delighted to, to be able to care for this piece. And, you know, you got to love conservators and art teachers and librarians, you know, they ran the world. But, and Tom, to jump in, Catherine Morris is with us here and says that a coiled electronic heating element from a stove is inside. Oh, great. And I forgot that. Don't plug it in. <laughs> so this is a question um, for both of you that I think is really interesting. And um, they ask, could, uh, how can we understand the role of gender in relation to Judith's work? Huh. I don't know if I've thought about that um, very much. I think there are some, um, and, you know, maybe Valerie, you have ideas. I mean, there are some, well, I would say stereotypical um, questions. People have thought about her work as being feminine or feminist um, in some ways. And I think there are traditions of women working with fiber and yarn and fabric, but I don't mean to disparage or exclude or assign those kind of qualities to one gender or another, but I think there are historical um, precedents for it. Um, and, uh, you know, and I, I think um, I, just, I, I, I see that the tactile part is being important. I don't know, Valerie, do you have thoughts on that as well? My observation is that it, indeed there's a, uh, an expertise uh, that is visible in uh, the works of Arbrut artists, uh, works by women, and many of them have been made by textile. But I think in Judith's case, I don't think it applies necessarily I mean, first of all, I think that her work is sculptural, and I think that sculptures historically have been more like associated to works made by by male artists. So I think that it 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 can bring us to different directions very quickly. I, I would not try to necessarily like lock this um, expertise to uh, to a specific gender in the case of uh, of Judith. I know some art historians have looked at her work in relationship to things like lace making and weaving and fabric that are, were traditionally practiced um, predominantly by women, um, whether that was a factor for her, it's hard to say because she didn't understand that or have knowledge of the, that historical precedent. Thank you. Um, so one final question about process, and this comes to us from Stacy, um, who asked, did Judith ever stand um, while working? Um, and how did she reach or work around some of those larger pieces? Oh, good question. No, she never stood. She always worked while she was sitting. I thought you said, did she understand? But then I realized you said, did she ever stand? Um, no, I mean, she, she stood, of course, as a person. She walked into the studio and she would bend over and get her boxes and things and put them, and then she would sit down. I never once recall seeing her ever working on um, all standing. It's funny, we have an artist named Ray Dell Early at Credit Growth who only works while standing and we've never seen him sitting. So, uh, and they were there at the same time. So I guess they were counterpoints. 
Mm -hmm. So we have a number of questions. I think we'll close the Q&A with um, some questions that we have about exhibition and selection um, and how artists at Creative Growth um, build their careers, how they become known outside mm -hmm. um, of the uh, organization. And then also, I think this is a very interesting question, but um, someone asked if Judith ever selected works or had a process for sort of choosing her works for exhibition. Sure, I'll start with the second first. Um, there was an exhibition early on um, uh, when I started at Creative Growth that of Judith's work solo show in the gallery that she um, was invited to participate in and she had some but limited interest in that. And uh, she would walk around and she would sort of tap the sculptures on their heads like they were her children she hadn't seen in a while, but she wasn't really interested in, in you know, uh, or engaging with, with the exhibition quality, but she did come to that and others. In terms of how creative growth artists advance, I think there's a clear organizational direction for our artists to be seen as contemporary. So you follow the path of contemporary artists, which you engage collectors, curators, um, museum people to with work that when it's ready, like for Judith Scott, after 20 years, you don't, know, um, like any contemporary artist, it's a practice. And when the work seems ready, you try to present it. The outsider field has largely been driven by collectors because the academic world never quite knew what to make of it. That's changing. So a written work like Judith's was first presented to collectors and then the American Folk Art Museum was the, one of the first art um, institutions that, that took it on. So that gave it credibility and then the collection of art grew. So the outs, in Judith's case, the outsider um, uh, people embraced it first and then it started to cross over, you know, independent curators like, you know, Matthew Higgs and Catherine Morris and, and, and people who had um, followings and influence in contemporary work, but they were open-minded in terms of where work could come from, became very influential people in terms of positioning the work um, sort of outside of the ghetto, if you will, and moving it into um, mainstream um, contemporary relevance. Thank you. Um, and I, I think that this, thinking about creative growth a little bit more broadly, we had one other question here that I think we'll close with. Um, and this was, can you share your view on process in many artist creations and creative growth? Um, and this person writes, all three of the artists in the talk, especially Judith, seem to always work um, focused on process rather than um, the final object, art object. And that is a common thread at creative growth, that it's a very process-based studio where the artists, despite their social relationships with each other, despite their um, individual circumstances or difficult days come in and get to work, they do their own thing. It's, it's process-based. It's changing, but very few have as much interest in the final product as they do in the process. Almost most don't really ask to um, take the object home or have that kind of relationship with it. Um, and I think, you know, artists are proud of their achievement and if a work sells and they earn money from that or it's viewed positively or gets critical, you know, it, uh, the people are, are glad about that increasingly. Someone like Judith or our earlier post uh, pre-88 population didn't have those expectations. Our mainstream younger people with disabilities have professional aspirations and expectations and social um, goals and uh, have a higher um, expectation in terms of what the response will be. But even within those groups, it's the process, the process, the process. Well, thank you so much, um, Valerie and Tom, for sharing so much today. It's been a fabulous program, um, wonderful insights, so much um, that we learned about Judith and this world more broadly. And um, for everyone listening, um, we hope that you'll explore other artists from Creative Growth and other artists from our collection online. Um, and thank you again. Thank you all so much. Thank you.